We all have passions that push us to do big things in life. For me, it's recording this podcast. For others, they like selling their crafts online, all out of a deep burning love for logistics and order management. Ugh, no one's passionate about that part, but that's why they're ShipStation. They make it easy to manage your orders and get your products out the door so you can get back to doing what you really love, growing your business. I use ShipStation to sell all my merch for Ratchet and Respectable and don't waste your pretty. I love that it's so easy. No matter how you sell, Shopify, Etsy, your own website like me, ShipStation funnels all of your orders into one simple interface that you can manage from anywhere, even your cell phone. Ship more in less time for a lot less money. Just use my offer code RESPECT to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the little microphone at the top of the page, and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Enter offer code RESPECT. Make ship happen. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and people who don't identify as either, you are listening to Ratchet and Respectable with Demetria. Good morning, everyone. It is 7.03 from wherever I am in Mexico. I am sitting on the balcony of my hotel. That sound you hear going by in the background, that's a motorbike. I am on a little island two hours outside of Cancun. So I landed at Cancun Airport, took a bus for two hours, then took a ferry for 30 minutes, then took a golf cart, literally a golf cart, 20 minutes from the ferry drop off. And I'm staying in a glorified tree house. Like I've posted pictures on my Instagram. That's what it is. It's a glorified tree house. It's like some real like Robin Caruso meets like the Flintstones type ish. Like everything is wood. Everything seems locally crafted. Like you can see that it's handmade, like very well handmade, but thatched roofs. Absolutely beautiful. Um, there are very few cars on the island. I've seen a couple trucks mostly used for transport. Um, actually, no, like just just car cars, just golf carts, taxis is how everyone gets around. It is absolutely amazing. I'm on the patio of my suite. We're on the second floor and it's a big patio. Like New York, they would try to call this like an extra bedroom, but it's like a really big patio, all wood. And the view is like panoramic greenery. It looks very like Wakanda, even though we're in Mexico. But my friend and I, Davida, who's with me, we've been walking around and we keep talking about like how much this place looks like Ghana, like e even in terms of like the design of the hotels and um, just the look of it, the feel of it all, like the water, like everything feels very much like Ghana, which I've traveled to a couple of times with her and she's Ghanaian, so she would know better than I, but absolutely beautiful. But this view is like sick. It's technically swamp because I can see like the, um, the trees are sitting in the water, it's muddy water, but like as a whole, looking at the forest and not the trees, it's just like technicolor green, beautiful blue skies, fluffy white clouds, it sounds like I'm just like making some shit up. You can hear my voice is a little scratchy. One, like I'm on the balcony. It's a tree house. There's not very much like insulation. There's just like, you know, what looks like bamboo for walls and laid wood for floor and ceiling. Um, it's not very soundproof. My neighbors upstairs get up in the morning. I can hear them walking around and making lots of noise. So I imagine if I speak too loud, um, they can probably hear me too. So I'm trying to keep it to a minimum when I talk to you. Um, but I've been having like the most amazing, amazing time. Yesterday, Davida and I got up and we have like our little ritual. We do breakfast every morning and we try to get some form of like exercise in just for 30 minutes every day because, you know, we black girls and, you know, we don't do our cardio, keep our metabolism high. Things start to get out of control. So even on vacation, we make sure that we do a little something. But we got up yesterday and we walked. We were like, okay, let's do a 30 minute walk and let's go in the opposite direction of where we've been coming back and forth to go to like the, the city that's, um, that's near the, the ferry port where we came in. We've been exploring lots of restaurants and um, cutesy stuff on, on the main strip. 
beachside restaurants and everybody's got a um everybody's got like a swing or like these like beautiful cabanas you know sitting out by the beach it's like so glorious so we walked the other way and maybe we got like five minutes in and we saw people walking like in the middle of the ocean on one of those I guess it's a sand bank not really familiar with all these like geological terms but people were like walking like at ankle length water if that in like the middle like smack dab in the middle of the ocean so like we walked out like a good say like four or five minutes it only came up to like right under my tush and I'm like five four I'm lying I'm five two and one fourth but I like to say I'm five four to feel taller but I'm really five two stay with me but like the water came up like right under my tush and then like it quickly sank back down to around like my knees and then my ankles. And Davida and I walked for like a good, I don't know, three fourths of a mile. And there were like a few other people out there, but like, you know, like five in a whole ocean. So that was our our morning walk. And then we came back and we walked like, you know, deeper in to get like a good thigh workout. When we got back to the resort, I was like, I feel like I've done a whole Billy Blanks workout. Like, yo, my legs are killing me. As a matter of fact, my legs are killing me right now. I haven't done my workout yet. I'm going to go do that. After I finish the podcast, I got to record and then edit and get get it up and out to you all. I'm a little nervous about getting the Wi-Fi. Yesterday, I had to do like the only quote and unquote work because the stuff I call work is the stuff that most people call fun, like watch TV. The only quote and unquote work I have I have planned to do other than this podcast, which I also don't consider work, even though, you know, it's a good check, is I was part of a tweet party with XO Nicole and BET for the second season of First Wives Club. I also worked with BET to do the marketing, which you hear right now is one of the golf carts going by. The town doesn't have paved roads, and whenever it rains, the streets flood actually pretty bad. Think of like how Miami streets get when it rains. So imagine that with like not paved roads. And that's what the golf carts are like going through. So like that noise and that splash and that water, that's what you heard. That's what just happened. But the second season of First Wives Club just came out. I worked the first promo for BET about like a year or two ago. They were delayed shooting like everyone else because of COVID. But my girls are back. Um, It was a really good show. Even if XO Nicole and BET had been like, oh, come do this Twitter party. I probably would have talked about it anyway because like I, I love jill scott in this show like she's so like random and extra and her storyline this season is um is very how stella got her groove back so you know exactly what that means with the younger man and then ryan michelle baith is on here she is she is a fine and wonderful actress in her own right but her husband is also an actor and he is better known to us at this time sterling k brown aka randall from This Is Us, but she's a really great actor and she's on the show and she's really, really, really good. She's not just like Sterling K. Brown's wife. She is Ryan Michelle Bath. Who else? There's another woman on the show. Her name escapes me right now. What is her name? She's got big puffy hair. She's really good. She's the funny one on the show. They also got a new cast member, Michelle Michinor. So there were three women on the show first season and they went and got like a fourth friend, which I was like, do we need a fourth? You know, I'm like territorial about my girls, but the new girl is really, really good. She adds a little balance to the show. Michelle Boutou, she's like the the life of the show. She's the, um, I don't know if I want to call this, but I don't want to call her, you know, a country she's not, but she's definitely Latina, a black Latina at that. But she's a good time on the show. I love her. She plays Brie. Brie is nuts, but I love Brie. The Brie got to get it together. Brie and Gary, that's her husband on the show. Last season was on Gary. Gary was cheating because he said Brie wasn't paying him enough attention. And now they're back together. And Brie is like in bed in a bonnet in ugly pajamas picking her chin hair. And I'm like, ma'am, I know it's your husband. I know it's your house. You need a place to be comfortable. But like picking your chin hair in bed with your husband, is that's not sexy. That's not sexy. He shouldn't be picking his chin hair either. I'm not just picking on her because she's a woman. But you got to, you know, keep some mystery and some sexiness in the mirror. It's just really hard like when you're living with somebody to like keep things fun and exciting. It's like, I can smell your fart. Like, that's gross. I need to not smell it if you expect any kind of romance out of me. It's, it's a mood killer. It's, it's, it's drying. But yeah, so I was like, they have an interesting storyline coming. And Ryan and her husband, I'm not really a fan of him. On the show, not in real life. Like, I'm calling her Ryan. 
what is her name on the damn show? That's the problem with like knowing people's names in real life and knowing their own stories. Her name's Ari on the show. But when you know them in real life, like you know them as actors and actresses and you know like their whole story, you'd be like, yeah, Ryan and her husband. But are you talking about Sterling? Or are you talking about the dude on the show? I'm talking about the dude on the show. He's dry. Like their storyline last season was like, and this is the first episode, so I'm not giving anything away, but they have a terrible sex life. I was appalled and offended and outraged, like my mouth dropped. And she was like, I haven't had an orgasm the whole time I've been married. And she'd been married like 10 years. And I was like, ma'am, absolutely not. But it was no wonder. Like once you saw their sex scene, I was like, well, yeah, like how was you supposed to get off? Because it didn't last very long. It was a really good show. I had to, um, and I'm not just saying this because they're a sponsor. I had to use my Express VPN to watch the show. Because I was like, oh, yeah, I'll live tweet it. And they were like, aren't you traveling? And I was like, it'll be fine. I'm in Mexico. It'll be great. Don't worry about it. I'm staying in a cute place. I'll have great Wi-Fi. No worries. I had to, like, go sit in the lobby because that's where the good Wi-Fi is. And my Express VPN, I had to, like, go through a couple different places in order to watch it. But it was worth the effort. But I was like, yeah, that might have not been the best idea I've had to, like, you know, try to stream video. Not even while in a foreign country. It's not like America's the only place with Wi-Fi. But, you know, while being on a tiny island, two hours off the coast of, you know, the next big city, and then not even be in the city on the island, is an ambitious idea. But it all worked out. What else is going on in the world? I saw the Emmy nominations were in. I haven't seen everybody that got nominated. That everyone's been talking about is um, Lovecraft Country. Because Lovecraft, which was like my favorite show, when it was on TV, and everyone else's. I was in this Lovecraft Country group on Facebook. It was thousands of people when the show was on. But I was like an active participant in the group. Like, you know, we were trying to figure out like all the illusions and what all this meant and who these characters were and what their names were a throwback to and history about the Tulsa massacre that was depicted on the show. Like we got really, really into it. Um, it was a very good, engaging show to me. A lot of critics didn't like it. I saw like some really terrible reviews, like panning the show. And I was like, really? Because this is like appointment TV for me. Like, like, I look forward to watching it with everyone else watching it so we can talk about watching it and then spend the rest of the week dissecting it and then watch again. Like, I, I love that show. Um, but HBO, um, infamously, I would say, didn't pick it up for season two. And a lot of people were really, really pissed. Like, how are you going to give me a favorite show that's like, you know, I'm addicted to and I analyze and I rewatch and overwatch and talk to all my friends about. And then you're not going to give me a season two for it. Like WTF. But HBO didn't give um, Lovecraft a season two. And Misha Green, she's the creator of the show. She released at least the, um, the overall premise for season two, which sounded amazing. You know, black people got magic. I love that I can have this conversation with y'all and y'all get where I'm coming from because I'm so excited about it. But black people got magic at the end of season one. And it's like, OK, black people have infinite possibilities now. What will they do with their magic? I really wanted to know. But part of it, it seems, is like the continental United States, black people in their magic. It seems they gave the West back to the Native Americans because that's the right thing to do. We stole their land. Really, they deserve the whole thing because we stole all of it. But in Misha's fictional world, the Native Americans got half. It seemed like the black people got the southern part of the United States, which, you know, and we were brought over on ships, most of us. But, you know, we were in the latter. We were in the south. So, OK, that's our home now. That makes sense. And it seems like white people got like the, the upper northeast, which I guess all the upper northeast is like Boston now. I don't know. I hope you guys can hear me over the golf cart rolling by and then there's like this weird middle section that I didn't wasn't quite sure what was there Misha was answering questions on Twitter and she was like oh that's where the zombies are and I was like girl what you know it's a show about magic and I guess like and I guess Misha said that in order for black people to get all the magic there's also like a trade-off so like something really great happens but something bad also happens like you know I guess like a a plus and a minus you know keep everything in balance but there were zombies contained in like this middle area kind of looked like Tennessee, somewhere in there. I don't really know my geography like that, but it looked to be like the Tennessee region. Let's just go with that, like the middle of like the South and the North, but not like Maryland, Virginia, lower than that. So like Tennessee, right? Sure. Um, but it looked absolutely fascinating. And I was like, I would have loved, I would have loved this. 
And apparently the Emmys loved it too because they got 18 nominations. Lovecraft got 18 nominations. A show that got canceled after season one got 18 Emmy nominations. I was like, what? Something ain't right. Something ain't right. But you know, when God closes the door, he opens a window. Or is it closes the window, opens the door? I think I like closing the window and opening the door better just because the door is bigger. Unless you're like living in a loft because then you could have like really big windows. But then you could have like a door like what's on this tree house right here and it's like a wall. So stay with me. I'm just going to go with close the window, open the door just because, you know, I think for the average size window and the average size door, I know I sound crazy. Just stay with me. Close the window, open the door. Misha got an overall deal with Apple. Misha. Misha Green. I'm talking like I know this woman. I do not know her. I have never met her. But she got an overall deal with Apple. I have no idea how much it's for, but I was like, sis better be getting her her seven-figure coin at minimum. I would prefer eight for her because she's a talented woman. I want her to have all the nice things and live in all the nice and safe and sexy places and be able to pay a whole bunch of, you know, other good creatives that are highly melanated to work with her to create epic shit. And I was like, I know she has a million really good ideas because, you know, Misha's brain is, you know, special. And I mean that in a good way because you can't have like a regular brain and come up with like, we're going to put zombies in, in Tennessee. Your brain's a little off for that, which I thank her for. You don't want somebody with like a straight and narrow brain, you know, creating all your art. It'd be boring. But I was like, I know you got good ideas, sis. I know you got great ideas. And I want to see them all executed with amazing budgets and Apple support because they have like unlimited money. But if you could just start by giving us the third season of Underground, because she also did that. And when Underground was on TV, that was also my favorite show on television. Like I lived for Underground. I need to know what happened to the mama. I know old girl, and I wanna say the baby, got to the North, but what happened to her mama? I know what happened to her brother, but her younger brother and her mom, like I need to know that they made it out of slavery. I hope. Ernestine, that was the mama. I think she did make it out of slavery, but she wasn't reunited with her daughter. I need some, I need a happy ending to that show. I was way too invested. If she could kindly give us three more seasons of Underground, I need a third, fourth, and fifth, at least. Like, you can give me some new characters that, like, run away every season. Like, I'm fine with that. We can do, like, you know, follow a new adventure. Adventure. A new escape from slavery. It's not like they're on an odyssey. Folks trying to get free and live. But I was like, if we could have that, Misha, I would really, really appreciate it. And then, you know, also, in addition to, and we could also have, you know, seasons two, three, four, and five of Lovecraft. That would also be amazing. And I don't need new characters for that. Like, I like the characters that you have. But if you'd like to resurrect some people, I would like you to, you know, bring Courtney B. Vance back. That would be great. And then Jonathan Major's tick. If you could bring him back and give him an equal number of naked scenes, that would be wonderful, too. I mean, they got magic. The white people were bringing people back left and right. So, so, And that was, like, the same magic that the black people have now. The black people should be able to bring people back, Yeah. Like, come on, Misha, girl. I'm happy for you, sis. I want you to do all of the things. I'm ready for whatever you want to give us. But if you could please just start with those two shows, I would be most, most, I would be most, most appreciative. That's part of our good black news this week. There's tons more people who got nominated for Emmys. My Wi-Fi is slow, and I don't feel like going through all of them right now. We'll talk about the Emmy list next week. Over the weekend, when we get to the new hotel, hopefully when I have better Wi-Fi, me and DeVito get together and we'll talk about the rest of the news, including the Emmys that's happening. But there are a few more things that I want to talk about before we get to today's interview with one of my favorite people, Cody Elaine Oliver. She and her husband, Tommy, are the creators of Black Love. And I'll talk about them in a second. We have more to talk about first. There are hundreds of companies out there claiming to compare auto and home insurance rates but there's only one who actually does it. Get a better insurance with Gabby. And I know it because I've done it. Gabby is the one true comparison platform with fast, verifiable quotes, not ballpark guesses. 
Use your current policy to find a better policy, comparing your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Progressive, Nationwide, and Travelers, and all in one place. Use your current insurance information to get started. It's free, and they only show policies that are the same or better than your current coverage, many of them at a lower price. Gabby helped me find the right auto insurance policy. It was so easy to use. I logged in with my current auto insurance provider and Gabby gave me a list of quotes. The good news, I actually have a good policy. I love knowing that I'm not being overcharged. Gabby customers save $961 per year on average and they'll never sell your info. So no annoying spam or robocalls. Put your policy to the test like I did. Get a better insurance with Gabby. It's totally free to check and there's no obligation. Go to Gabby.com slash Ratchet. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash Ratchet. Gabby.com slash Ratchet. There are some things that are just better at home, like sleeping in your own bed or watching movies on your couch. You know what else is great at home? Peloton. With Peloton, you'll have a workout experience like no other without ever leaving home. Now, what I love most about Peloton is those music-themed classes. I like to get into the archives and listen to Lizzo and Beyonce and Outkast. With epic artist collaborations and instructor-curated playlists, Peloton's music experience is unlike any other. Whether you're in the mood for some hip-hop, pop, or even country, the Peloton bike has the right music to keep you entertained and motivated all year long. Also, whatever your mood or overall fitness goal, you can mix and match classes for a total body workout experience. Choose from cardio, strength, yoga, Pilates, outdoor runs, meditation, and more. With the Peloton bike, there's nothing like working out from home. Learn more at OnePeloton.com. New members can try Peloton classes free for 30 days at OnePeloton.com slash app. Terms apply. That's O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N dot com. I want to give a shout out to my friend Tarana Burke. She's the founder of Me Too. And before that, 10 years before that, um, is when I met her and we initially became friends. She has a book coming out later this year and I think it's published on Oprah's imprint. I don't want to tell Tarana's whole story. I know a lot of it. I don't know all of it. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading her book as much as anybody else because I know enough to know it's a hell of a story. But Oprah tweeted yesterday, I just finished Unbound, which is the title of, of Tarana's book. And Oprah said it's, quote, searing, powerful, needed. Thank you. Tarana's caption was, y'all, y'all. It was like, I know ma'am is, you know, me too in, in the cover of Time and all of the, the wonderful accolades that she's received and deserved and earned. She wasn't just given them, she earned them over the last few years. But when I tell you, and you know, because she came on the show, she is a regular, degular girl from the Bronx who happens through a lot of hard work and a lot of God's grace to be living a very extraordinary sort of life but she is still at her core a girl from the Bronx um and so like you know Oprah publishing your book Oprah tweeting about your book telling the world how amazing it is you know it still hits her like she's sitting in the Bronx which good for her never change this I mean grow and be more magical and mystical and amazing but like you know at that core keep that Bronx girl because that's part of like what makes you you but I can't wait one to read the book in her own words, because she's also a writer in addition to everything else. Writing is her first love, along with loving black people. I've been friends with her, like, you know, ever since we met, like, 10 years ago. And right before Me Too came to a head, she was in a space in life that she didn't want to be in. She made a lot of good choices, and things just weren't working out for her. Um, and then Me Too happened, and her life changed in a day like literally a day. I'll let her tell you the whole story. But whenever I think about, you know, I used to tell you I was like marching up and down them hills in my parents' neighborhood, like listening to Vashon Mitchell, like listening to him sing, is turning around for me or, you know, 
it won't always be like this. Waiting for God to basically come and rescue me. Like, please, please, I know you didn't bring me this far to drop me off here. Did you? Did you? I'm unclear because I'm lost. I need help. But Tarana's story, specifically around me too, is one of the people that I think about and I'd be like, yo, like your life can change in a day. Your whole life can change in a day. Like it's all things are possible through Christ, which strengthens me. That Bible verse was over the, um, the pulpit at my grandfather's church in Detroit. Philippians? I don't know. Don't get me to lying on like what actual verse that is, but I grew up looking at it my whole life. But like all things are possible with God. So congratulations to Tehran. I can't wait to read this daggone book. One of the things that Davida and I have been talking about, which is completely unintentional, but she's like one of the all-purpose friends that like, you know, you can travel with and like take shots with and like bury your body with and also do like 7 a.m. morning workouts with. Like she's just one of those people. She's an entrepreneur as well. And like we've been sitting around just it's casual beach conversation, masterminding business ideas. And she was like, like 50 million other people have asked me, so when are you going to do a book club, sis? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, where did that come from? She's like, I mean, you know, you read books, you like books, you talk about books. Half your friends are authors as well. Why don't you have a book club? And I was like, I mean, I know I've been talking about it. And she was like, yeah, I've heard you talk about it. I haven't seen you do it. So we sat down and executed a whole book club plan for 2022. And I was like, well, I know whose book I want to kick it off with. And because I talk about books from time to time, publishers send me their book list. So I kind of know what's coming down the pipeline. But I was like, wouldn't I want to kick this off with Tarana's book? Wouldn't that be amazing? I think it comes out this fall. But if Oprah's tweeting about it now, maybe it comes out. You know what? Fall isn't that far away. I'm sitting here talking like I think it's April, but it's like midway through July. Like fall is in like a month and a half. Yikes. This year is going by so fast. You know what isn't going fast? It's getting over fucking COVID. I was scrolling last night before I went to bed and I was exhausted, but still laying in the bed on my phone when I needed to go to sleep so I could get up early and tape this podcast. And I saw that California, my home, is reinstating a mask mandate. And I said when California opened up, I was like, I don't necessarily think we're in the end of COVID. I would not be shocked if we shut down again because the number of people that need to be vaccinated, I guess to tip the scales in terms of safety, are not being vaccinated. Like there's a whole bunch of people who are just like, I refuse to vaccinate and COVID is a hoax and I'm not giving in to this shit. You know, these MAGA motherfuckers ruining it for everyone. I'm on the road for another 25 days. I have no idea what state California is going to be in when I get back to it. But I know I will be wearing a mask. In general, I would wear one when I was just around, like, you know, groups of people, even like the elevator, just because it's like an enclosed space and someone could come on with me. But I was, I, was, I was still wearing my mask, but it was good to not have to. But now we back at it. I mean, if it's wear a mask or, you know, die or even get sick, because I'm like fully vaccinated, but I ain't trying to get sick either. That is totally not lost on me that um, I haven't had so much as a common cold since I started wearing a mask last March. And I was like, you know, we can keep this energy. I didn't even have allergies this year. So I was like, we can keep this energy. I'm stomping on the floor. That's what you just heard. Because again, I'm sitting on the patio. And if you've been following my adventures on my, my Instagram or even Facebook stories, I've been posting, and one of the videos that I posted was a little dragon. There's another proper name. It's like a large lizard. I don't, I don't know if it's an iguana. I need to pay more attention in, like, biology classes or science. Or is that kindergarten, which I skipped, by the way. Is that where we learn the names of different animals? I don't know. There is what appears to be a small dragon coming onto the patio. And when I saw the dragon the other day, I was like, Chakaris. Tricaris. And I wanted to see if it would breathe fire, which is a really bad idea, seeing as how I'm living in a treehouse right now. But I'm looking at the dragon and it's coming around the patio. It's seeing me and it's looking at me and it's not moving. And that's why I stomped my foot so it would like be afraid. But this dragon is like a New York pigeon and has no fear. Fuck. 
y'all might not get the rest of this podcast. Okay, it's kind of turning around, but it's still there. No, it's just turning its head and body, but it's still there. I'm going to throw a pillow at the dragon. Do you think that'll stop it? But then I don't want to, like, throw a pillow over the balcony, and then it gets dirty, and they like, charge me for the pillow. But if it's that, or be, like, attacked by a dragon, you know, you got to do what you got to do in these circumstances. Y'all. It's just there. And it's like moving its head up and down. I don't... Okay, I'm going to continue with the podcast. If I get, like, burnt alive by a dragon or attacked by a dragon and, like, jump over the balcony, like, it's been real. And I enjoyed every moment of sharing this podcast with you. Hopefully someone will upload this It's in its entirety. They'll be like, why did she jump over the balcony? Did she commit suicide? No. She was trying to escape a small dragon. Y'all, there's a dragon on my balcony. Dragon. Okay, it's turned around. It's going away. I don't think it's the me stomping that's stopping the dragon. I think the dragon is just like, she don't look like delicious food. I don't look sugary, maybe. I don't know. But the dragon is going away. I am safe to live another day and record another podcast. Look at God's grace. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. We need to talk about these um, AKAs, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, as they like to call it. Um, they added some new members to their group. Ruth Carter, Alice Walker, Ursula Burns, Robin Roberts, Lisa Leslie, Tracy Ellis Ross, and the only one that people were texting and DMing me about, Cynthia Arrivo. Cynthia Arrivo was made an honorary AKA. People, and I will say this, three people reached out to me. All of them are in sororities. None of them are members of Alpha Kappa Alpha. I think their opinion of whether Cynthia Arrivo should be in their sorority is, is really the only one that matters. I'm not in a sorority. As a matter of fact, when I was in college, I wanted to join AKA and they had no interest in me. I tried again when I was living in Brooklyn and they had no interest in me. So, you know, I'm not quality AKA material, apparently, which I actually feel no way about. I did at one point and I'm just like, you know, I'm good. Life turned out okay for me. Um, I'm all right. But Cynthia Revo was added and, you know, Cynthia Revo is a little bit controversial. She's um, British Nigerian and she's, I think her biggest controversy well, I guess they all stem from the same thing. Cynthia Revo doesn't have the best track record on speaking about black Americans. I've always heard that, and I've seen people react to her roles because she's played, she played Seely in The Color Purples, which brought her to fame, and then she played Harriet in that big film, which was interesting. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't good. It took me a while to watch it because everybody said how bad it was. And then I watched it, and I was like, it wasn't as bad as y'all said it was. But I also wasn't like, y'all, it was very good. That, that wasn't my reaction either. And she also just played Aretha Franklin in that eight-part series on Nat Geo, which I thought was a really good show. I didn't particularly care for her as Aretha. I didn't think she butchered the role. I didn't think she embarrassed herself or anything. Part of Aretha's Aretha-ness is Aretha's stature, like, the, she's a, a, a woman of size, and she has, like, the boobs, and she wears the very sexy dresses with her boobs all out. Like, it's very much, like, brand Aretha. And so not to get that, for most of the film, was weird. Like, the whole film, like, you know, Cynthia Erivo is playing Aretha at Cynthia Erivo's, like, proper size, which is, like, size zero. She's a very small woman. She works out, like, 24-7 to, to keep that size, which is fine. Um, but it's just not like Aretha size. And then like in the last 30 minutes of the film, she like shows up in a fat suit, which was just jarring. Like the costuming department like did their thing. Like they, they went above and beyond. They were amazing. I needed warning. I needed gradual fat. I just, it was, it was a lot. And when she was in the fat suit, she really moved me. I was like, okay, now I feel it. I feel the Aretha-ness. And I was like, maybe sis wasn't, you know, bad in the film. She just needed a fat suit to, like, you know, bring the aretha to life. She sounded good, though, you know. 
not like Aretha, but on, there is only one Aretha. In, in fairness to Cynthia, it's not like Cynthia can't sing. It just wasn't Aretha singing. Her interpretation of Aretha's songs was very good. I say all that to say, there's controversy around Cynthia. She doesn't have the best track record when it comes to speaking about African Americans. And then she's taken on these roles where she's played very prominent African American characters. So, you know, a lot of black folks are like, you should have a black woman, an African American black woman, because, you know, African American is not the only way to be black. But to have an African American black woman play African American historical figures. And if you so choose not to do that, if you would like to get a British actress to take on that role, we, we maybe more could accept it if it was someone who hadn't been outspoken about their distaste for African Americans or African American culture. Now, I'd always heard that about Cynthia Revo, and I had to go look up exactly what she said, because I always see people like very much in a tizzy over her and... Um, there's another, I guess, blogger, podcaster, author, who's also um, of Nigerian descent. She's American Nigerian, um, who's also had some unfavorable takes on African Americans. Those two are friends, um, but she also gets dragged a lot. But I had to go look up exactly what Cynthia Revo said, and it's y'all. So apparently, at some point on Twitter, she had made fun of what she called a ghetto accent of African Americans. And this is from six years ago. I don't know if she was talking about like an actual ghetto accent because we're not gonna act like there isn't one. Um, or if she was referring to like, I guess black Americans speak overall ghetto or not. Was she specifically speaking about like ghetto shit or was she speaking about African Americans as a whole and classifying them as ghetto? She was in a, like, she got a lot of flack for that. And many years later, she had to address it, I think, when she was promoting Harriet. Um, but she said, quote, as for the tweets taken out of context without giving me the room to tell you what it meant, and it wasn't mocking anyone, really. That's what she said. She says, it wasn't for that purpose at all. It was to celebrate a song I had wrote when I was 16. She was at the uh, Toronto International Film Festival. She, and she addressed this issue again. She said that she, quote, never spoken negatively about people. I would never. I've never spoken negatively about people because I don't want that. I don't want that energy for me to others. I don't believe that serves us at all. I don't believe it serves a purpose other than bringing negativity into my life and your life. And I just don't want that. So, I don't know. I don't know. But I say all that to say. She's now an honorary AKA. Some of my friends who were in sororities were pissed. They were like, how do you add a woman who like has slandered black culture to like the oldest sorority for black women? Like that doesn't strike anyone as weird. Like of all the people to add, why this woman who's been outspoken about, you know, calling black culture ghetto? Like why her of all people? You couldn't find no one else. Um, but there's also been people celebrating her as well. It's not just people saying it's trash. Again, my opinion is whatever the majority of, of AKAs think. If y'all think it's a great idea, then it's a great idea. And if it's not, and if y'all don't, then it's not. Like, it's your organization, it's not mine. I literally have no skin in this game. And honestly, don't care. Like, because again, it has zero effect on me whatsoever. Cynthia is celebrating. She tweeted like the, you know, the go-to press line for anyone receiving anything, which she's honored to become a member or something like that. So, you know, congratulations. Good for her. She's happy to be there. Great. They're happy to have her. That's great, too. If they're not, still great. Again, it has no effect on me. So y'all can let me know what y'all think, but I am indifferent to it. We all have passions that push us to do big things in life. For me, it's recording this podcast. For others, they like selling their crafts online, all out of a deep burning love for logistics and order management. Ugh, no one's passionate about that part, but that's why they're ShipStation. They make it easy to manage your orders and get your products out the door so you can get back to doing what you really love, growing your business. ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers, including me. You can import orders from any sales channel, ship with any carrier using ShipStation's deeply discounted rates, and automate just about any shipping task. 
No wonder more than 100,000 online sellers choose ShipStation. I use ShipStation to sell all my merch for Ratchet and Respectable and don't waste your pretty. I love that it's so easy. No matter how you sell, Shopify, Etsy, your own website like me, ShipStation funnels all of your orders into one simple interface that you can manage from anywhere, even your cell phone. Ship more in less time for a lot less money. Just use my offer code RESPECT to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no-hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the little microphone at the top of the page, and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Enter offer code RESPECT. Make ship happen. I enjoy a nice glass of wine, especially after a stressful day. Now, I'm no expert. I just like what I like, but I also love trying new varieties, wines that my local store might not carry. That's why I love Vivino. Vivino is the world's biggest online wine marketplace. They're also the largest online wine community with 50 million users who have rated and reviewed just about every wine. Vivino carries all of my favorites, like the McBride Sisters Black Girl Magic Rosé. Plus, they suggest exciting personalized recommendations based on my taste. I never knew those wines existed, and now I know even more about what I like, thanks to Vivino. And their app is everything you need to know about wine, and so much more right in your hand. You can see all the ratings and reviews, you can leave your own, and of course, even buy wine. My favorite thing to do is scan a bottle when I'm shopping in a store and seeing what Vivino users have to say about it. What I also love about Vivino is their huge selection and how easy it is to shop on their site. They've helped me discover so many new wines to try. I've really stepped up my wine game thanks to Vivino. Give them a try and I know you're going to love it. Go to Vivino.com slash Ratchet and use code Ratchet at checkout to save 20% on your first order of up to $200. That's V-I-V-I-N-O dot com slash Ratchet. Code Ratchet to save 20% on your first order of up to $200. Vivino.com slash Ratchet. Code Ratchet. See site for details. Terms apply. Oh, last but not least, Shonda, Sister Shonda, Sister, Sister Shonda. So apparently she's getting a raise, a significant raise. It was reported on the Grio. She's getting a significant raise at Netflix. Bridgerton, which is from Shonda's production company, she's actually not directly over the show, but Shonda Land is the producer of Bridgerton. And Bridgerton, I believe I read, is the most watched Netflix show of all time. And I think that's the only show from Shondaland that's aired on Netflix so far. I remember last year we talked about how Shonda got this huge deal. And at the time it was rumored to be around 300 million, but then folks came back and said that actually it's closer to like 150 million. And I was like, well, you know, Shonda still be able to like, you know, feed the family off that. She'll be able to be all right. But I mean, I want her to have as many coins as possible. I'm not trying to limit her coins. But it seems that after the success of Bridgerton, which is slated to run for at least eight seasons, because it's based on an eight series book, and then they're doing a prequel to Bridgerton about at least two of the black characters on the show. I know Queen Charlotte, and then the black woman who is, she's not the Duke of, she's not the Duke's biological mom, because that mom died, but she came in and took care of the Duke after his father was an ass and disowned him. So her, two of the black ladies at least, are getting a prequel series about their lives. And then it's like the other episodes, other seven episodes based on this book. So they got years to come of of great ratings um, across the board because of Shonda. So they gave her a little raise. The new amount that she's getting, or at least Shonda Land is getting, it's not just directly to Shonda's like personal account, but it's between 300 and 400 million. And so it puts her on par with what I was reading other big producers, like, say, a Ryan Murphy, um, which I was like, get your coin, ma'am. Get your coin. You can buy brand cereal for the kids. They can go to private schools. I'm acting like this woman couldn't do this with a million. 
or, or, or 150 million, but 300 to 400 million, those are sexy numbers. I like them. I like them very much. I like them for Shonda very much. I'm very, very happy for her. Good for her. Because you know the woman be generating billions like she did for ABC Disney and then mofos wouldn't even give her an extra guest pass to get in goddamn Disneyland. How you let Shonda Rhimes go? That's going to be a forever question. I need to know who that executive is. Shonda was real nice at not naming the person. But I need to know who that was. I need to know if they're still working at Disney because like you let Shonda Rhimes get away? Nigga, what were you thinking? You were thinking that she would take it. But she didn't. She packed her talents, you know what I wanted to say, and took them elsewhere. It's good for her. So today's interview, which I did a while ago, I told you I was doing interviews and banking them in anticipation of this trip to make sure that the podcast would continue smoothly as I was bouncing around the world, the country, whatever. But one of the people I had the pleasure of interviewing is Cody Elaine Oliver. She and her husband, Tommy, as I mentioned earlier on the podcast, are the creators of Black Love. And so Black Love um, is a TV show about black love um, that airs on OWN. I think it's in season four or five now. I think it's in season, I think they just wrapped season four. But it's gone from, quote and unquote, just a documentary slash TV show to like it has an app. They have um, an event series, um, a website. Cody and Tommy have like dominated the black love space. I met them, I want to say like in 2014. The original idea for black love was a document, was a single documentary about black love. At the time, it was all these statistics about how black women don't get married. I think it was like 42% of black women didn't get married. And they were like, why? Also, even if 42% is the statistic of black couple or black people, black women specifically, nobody ever talks about black men not getting married. But if the statistic is 42% of black women are not getting married, still, that means 58% of black women are. Why are we only talking about the negative? Can we speak about the good as well? So they went on this you know, nationwide tour. They were interviewing couples and experts to get to the bottom of like what's going on with like black love. And they interviewed me um, shortly after I had been married. Um, and then maybe like a year or so later, they called and they told me that they sold the show and um, they'd taken out all the experts just to focus on the couples. They were like, so, you know, don't be alarmed when it airs. It's not like we just cut you, like we cut all the experts, but thank you for your time. We greatly appreciate you. And I was like, no worries. And they were so sweet. They were just like a really sweet couple. They have like a really great personal story too. So I was like, sis, get your coin, make your mark, build your legacy, Um, want all the best for you. I was able to catch up with her. It was the final episode of Black Love for this season. It had aired the night before. Sorry about that. That's the, uh, another one of the golf carts going through, but it had aired the night before. Um, and so we talked about all things love and like her approach to, um, her show and then her approach to business, because I didn't know that, um, that they still own black love outright own is like their distributor, but it's not the owner of black love. They still own it. I love people owning their content for obvious reasons. So it was really great to catch up with her. So without further delay, please welcome Cody Elaine Oliver to Ratchet and Respectable. So we're talking about black love and I'm super excited to talk to you because I feel like I've been a ride, been along for this ride since the very beginning when you and Tommy were out in New York and interviewing experts and different couples because the show was initially going in a different direction. Mm Mm-hmm. The original was a little more complex. So how did we get here? So we had initially planned on doing a documentary, like 90 minutes, one off, you know, the festival circuit. And then hopefully we get, you know, acquired by HBO or something. You know, that was the goal um, back in 2014 when you and I met. And I think that, yeah, that was well, 14, 15, something like that. Yeah. So the, the idea was to interview couples and to interview experts, therapists, uh, authors like yourself and Hill Harper and um, Lord, I don't even remember, historians. Like we had talked to all kinds of folks. And that was again around summer 2015. We were doing all of those interviews. 
Well, I mean, we did them much longer, but that was probably when we did our road trip and we came out to New York. And so we looked up at the end of the year with our editor and we, you know, asked him to put together sort of like a, a rough cut of, of a string out of sorts, right? Of some of the best, you know, hit, topics hit. And by January, what we realized is that we really wanted to spend more time with these couples. Mm -hmm. We really wanted to tell their stories and that the idea of what it takes to make a marriage work, plus the need for representation around uh, marriage and happiness and healthy relationships in the Black community was so needed that we just wanted to spend more time with the couples rather than telling anyone what it should be right? Rather than from, from the standpoint of experts, right? Rather than even offering the context that I was passionate about at first, which is like, man, the media is trying to tell us there's a black marriage crisis, you know, like that was some of what I felt we should include. And then realizing that really, it's not, it's not our job to say that, to, to even bring that back up. It's our job to showcase what a happy, healthy, loving relationship looks like with black people. With black people. What is your criteria for the couples? It's evolved only a little. So initially we set out, we, we've always set out to interview couples who would be honest and transparent about their experiences, their lessons, their growth, and frankly, tell us what it takes. I wanted to know all the worst things that happened in a marriage and how they got through them. So it was never meant to be salacious or anything crazy like that. It was the, quite the opposite. It was meant to be like, yes, tell me the worst thing. But now I'm looking at you and I'm wondering, how did you get from that to, to here? And so the criteria was that people had to be together 10 years or more, not necessarily married, but together so that they were really drawing on experiences as opposed to like, we met in March, we got engaged in May and married by June. You know, we wanted to really have people who had something to say about the, the work because we knew there was work. We just didn't know what it was because we were engaged and we got <laughs> engaged quickly. Um, so the criteria was, was time. And then that somebody recommended them. Somebody was saying, this couple inspires me or this couple made it through something and I don't know how they did it. And those were our two criteria. And the only way in which that's evolved is that we have included newlyweds that maybe were only, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we've included newlyweds that maybe were only together a couple of years, but could really speak to what's happened and how they've changed, you know, in those few years. And it was partly because people asked for it. People kept saying, you know, where are the newlywed couples? And so we, we said, let's try it. Let's see what they have to say. I've watched a few episodes and sometimes I'm stunned by the honesty, especially with the camera rolling. Like there are things that I'll say, like, you know, it's cocktails with the girls or it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a closed environment. Um, but like people say things with like the camera running and I'm just like, whoa, that's a lot. It's true, but it's a lot. I think that frankly, Tommy and I have always done these interviews the same. It's the two of us in the room with the couple and there's no PA, there's no gaffer, lighting technician, nobody else is there in your face, kind of making you feel some kind of way about what you're saying or making you second guess it. And we've also looked at our couples and said, hey, we are... Uh, engaged or we are married or we are married and expecting our first or second and third child. Like we've told them where we are in our relationship and said, help us get to where you are. And in doing that, I think it disarmed them a bit where they felt like, oh Lord, I, all right, I'm gonna come out with it because I want, I want y'all to win, <laughs> you know? And they're not just looking at us. I mean, uh, so many people that we've interviewed have done this because they know that our community needs to have these conversations. And so they're like, all right, I'm gonna let me be an example. But also, I think some of the couples that are that are the most transparent, even when it's like awkward, is because they've dealt with it in the relationship. They they have unpacked it, they have made their peace with it, or at least they know how it's contributed to their their growth. In interviewing so many couples, because it's gotta be over a hundred at this point, yeah? Uh, girl, over 200. Over 200. Jesus. Wow. What are the, I guess, the the takeaways that you've personally learned? Like, oh, that's something that I can incorporate. Honestly, so much. It's it's really just almost what you said about sometimes hearing people say things and being shocked. We've learned that anything can happen. We've learned that, frankly, if you want to, you can get through almost anything, um, but that it's not without work. And that that work begins with self. Yes, you're looking at someone who may have been unfaithful to you, or you're looking at someone who may have 
mismanage y'all's funds. But the question is like, how do you then deal with that person? How do you communicate with that person? How do you look at that person with humanity? If you so choose, right? Because you can also just walk away and vice versa, right? When you've made those mistakes, because you're an individual in a partnership, but you, but you have, but each of us has a lot to learn. And so honestly, the, the emphasis on self work, it, it became so much more apparent. I think talking to all these couples, how everything that we are, everything that we've seen, everything that we do plays into our romantic relationships. You, you, the thing that the, the fact that your dad said such and such to your mom when you were five might show up in your marriage when you're 45, you know, and you've got to realize, oh, shoot, I'm taking that out on my husband. You know what I mean? It, it's just us being aware of our biases, our expectations. And so I would say overall, that's, that's probably the biggest lesson that we've learned is that nothing comes from nowhere. We have to examine the root of our behaviors, our partner's behaviors, and we have to be willing to to look at one another as human and give grace. Give grace. That's so important. Like my favorite line is, um, there is grace for those that seek it. Yeah. The important part is the seeking because some folks just want grace and no work. But if there's work, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I was going to say too, that isn't to say that like every relationship is worth saving. I'm not saying that. I've never, I've never said that, you know, going into this, my parents were divorced. I know all the reasons they got divorced. And I know that sometimes that can make some of us like, I'm never getting divorced. Well, that doesn't mean put up with everything. So it is that that self-work is just as important in realizing how you can look at the other person as human, look at yourself as human and figure out what you're both capable of, but also what you're not. Like, oh, this thing that I'm looking at right here is not going to get better and it's not going to work for me. And and so knowing what your boundaries are, too, is where that self-work comes into play. One of the things that I love most about the show is what we've been calling transparency. But sometimes the couples confess, not confess, they talk about things that are really, really difficult. And one of the things that I love about the show is I think it demystifies what marriage is. I think um, just, you know, being in this space and the the dating relationship marriage conversation space for so long, a lot of people, even with all the transparency, the things couples talk about, think it's you get married and then it's happily ever after. It's like Mm -hmm. nonstop, you know, uh, vacations, uh, (laughs) the big wedding, and then you move into a gigantic house and you buy a bunch of cars. And, And you have perfect babies and you and everybody's happy and you're spending all your time with with equal responsibilities and yeah. Yeah. But I think your show like demystifies some of that. Well, yeah, I I hope that it demystifies some of that because the reality is that life is life and you go through, like, first off, life's going to throw things at you. So you're going to have to figure out how to, how to get through when some of those things don't happen. And it ain't even your partner's fault, right? When, when you don't have all the cars because you don't have any money because well, because of all the reasons. When you don't have children the way that you thought you would have children, you know, we we all are faced with with these issues that arise and might realize that our partner and I don't know how to deal with them the same. Um, And so I, I hope that our show demystifies the rainbows and butterflies and emphasizes that it is, it is, it's our responsibility to kind of Ooh, stay woke. <laughs> yes, I hear them kids. Sorry, sorry. No worries. Uh, ratchet and respectable family. Um, but, you know, you kind of have to stay woke within your relationship. Pay attention. Um, and and so, yeah, I, I do hope that our show provides a little bit of truth to, to relationships. To relationships. After interviewing over 200 couples, and some of the, uh, the couples that have been featured on the show didn't go the distance. They, they went to their separate ways for whatever reasons. Are you able to kind of think of like now therapists when they they write books about all the couples they've interviewed and they say that like, you know, I kind of knew, you know, based on their communication style or the way someone responded to this question that this might not work. Are you able to to see who might? No, (laughs) I will say absolutely not. And um, and that may just be me and my sort of eternal optimism, because one thing I don't do, let me say two things. One is that we have interviewed over 200 couples and only three, okay, maybe a fourth that I'm, that hasn't confirmed for me, but three have gotten divorced, two that were on the show and one that wasn't. And the one that wasn't actually, they had married each other three times. 
So mm-hmm. they, well. they got divorced and that was it. But I say that to say, we don't judge our couples, right? So even if something looks like it just ain't working, that's not my place. If, if they're sitting there telling me that, you know, this thing is a challenge for us, but we're working through it, or I can't stand that he does that, but I'm still here because I love 57 other things then I, I take them at at their word. Right. And, and they may mean it when they say it too. Let, you know, let's be clear. So I say that to say, no, I definitely don't look at people and think that at all, because we, you know, Tommy and I have our own issues where I'm like, if somebody caught us on the wrong day, (laughs) you might be like, Oh, how they, how they doing? Um, so I, I definitely wouldn't say that I called it on any of those. And we even have couples that are like, I have one couple in particular from season one that everybody has something to say on, uh, you know, I can't believe they talk to each other like that and they're not going to make it. And she's just tolerating him and all of this. And they happen to be good friends of mine that at that point had been together 12 years since college and married, I think four or five. So that was season one. We interviewed them probably 2015 aired it in 2017. Now this is 2021. They just had their second baby about a month ago. Uh, happy, happy as hell. So you just don't know what make what works for somebody may not work for you. And and that's another thing that I hope that our show does is that you can look at another couple, another, you know, other folks' experiences and, and, and not judge. I think that's probably like one of the reasons too, that people are so very transparent because you can tell when someone's sitting there judging you versus someone who's just there to hear your story. Yeah, yeah, definitely. One of the questions that is inevitably asked of women who are very successful, especially when they're married and they have children, the question is always, how do you do it all? Because I think so Mm -hmm. many people have ambitions to do like the most and they're just like, I only have 24 hours in a day. Like, how are you making all this happen? I'm not. Um, (laughs) Thank you. Honestly, I I keep it all the way real. I, I am struggling, especially right now. This year is harder than last year for me, to be honest with you. I don't know why in terms of like pandemic and no pandemic, but it, for me, it is challenging to have a career, um, that kind of dual careers because I do produce and direct this show with Tommy, but I also run Black Love Inc., which is a media company. We have, we have a podcast network, an app with digital series, digital content. We have robust social media channels, live and virtual events. I'm sure I'm leaving something out, but, um, I, lead all of that and frankly kind of jumped into it so I, I still have so much to learn so between those two things and us having three kids and um Tommy working full-time it is a lot it is a, and, I, and I'm supposed to be a wife too <laughs> I forgot I forgot about that that part <laughs> it is a lot and so I'm I'm trying to learn from others I love finding people who I'm like okay this person is doing it they seem to have some balance in their life they seem to be setting boundaries I'm trying to learn from them. I'll be honest. I love that. I love that. I greatly appreciate people who are, who are just like, I don't know. Because I think so <laughs> many people want to sound like experts and be like, yo, I'm, I'm doing this by like, you know, on the fly. I'm just doing it day by day. This is the best I can do. Yeah, exactly. Can we also talk about the business side of this? Because I, I know that many of the listeners, you know, they are entrepreneurs, they are business women, or, or they're creatives in some way, and they're interested in leveling up. And when I was reading up about the show, Um, I didn't realize you all owned the show. I just assumed this was like a, she was like, oh yeah. Um, Tell me about how you kept your rights um, so that you can branch out and do all these other projects based on Black Love, which you wouldn't if you turned the rights over or sold the rights. So really it came down to leverage for lack of a better word. It sounds like a dirty word in this, in this scenario, but I mean, leverage from the standpoint of we spent two plus years shooting interviews So by the time we went out with the series, we had almost two seasons done in terms of um, content. We had edited the full, we'd edited so much of season one, first episode, we had a sizzle, we had a detailed treatment. It was very clear what the show was. And it was also very clear that it was, that we didn't need anyone to pay for it, right? We don't, and so distributors, distributors are going to make more money because most of us come to them with a pitch and we're saying, you know, can you pay for this? And then it's yours and I'll make it because I love it and I'll get paid to make it. And so in this instance, we had so much completed already. And then of course it was negotiating because we still could have licensed it. We could, we still could have said um, here, I mean, excuse me, we're, we license it to them. We still could have sold it if we wanted to. But in this case, we wanted to license it because we knew we wanted to create a larger ecosystem 
from the the themes of the of the show and um and just our ability to use it to connect with our audience. Was that an easy sell or was that was there a lot of pushback from it? There actually wasn't a lot of pushback. Um honestly it was so little that I barely remember because um we went out to several networks with it. A few were interested, two in particular, of course, Own being one of them. One was less interested in the um, in us owning it, and Own was comfortable. So it was kind of like Own was on board, and it probably was the convergence of a lot of things at that time. You know, there were people in place who were super supportive of it. There was the eco- the the ethos of understanding that this is the Oprah Winfrey network and she owned her show and eventually and what that did for her. And so then wanting to support ownership in that way um, that I don't know is the same now. A lot of a lot of um, different people are, are running the company now. And so I think it was the right moment for us. And we did not receive a lot of pushback from own. But of course, we did take a lesser licensing fee than if they were buying it. Are you <laughs> signed for season six yet? Is there more to come? We'll see. We'll see. I would love to make sure that happens and I will keep you updated. But for now, we are um, we have the Black Love app, which features all past seasons of Black Love. Season five will be there eventually. We also have an after show, which I sometimes forget about, child. There's so much I didn't even say that before. There's so much going on that I actually host the Black Love After Show, which is on the Black Love Plus app right now from season four and season five, where we have some of the couples come back and watch the episodes and then like tell us what they think about seeing themselves and give us updates. And so we're just kind of keeping the conversation going, not just about the Black Love docuseries, but about the themes of love in our community. You know, right now we have a campaign called Father Noir, where Tommy um, took portraits of dads and their kids. Yes. And, you know, so we're, we're always just trying to push the conversation around how can we love better? How can we love more authentically and, and really just show that for our community, for our future generations so that they love themselves? I love that. I love that. I love that about you. Like we need more <laughs> positive content. Thank you. Across thank the you, board. I always like to ask my, my interviewees, like, is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you want my listeners to know about you? Ooh, um, you know, honestly, it goes back to what we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. You know, I am a work in progress and I'm super excited and um, passionate about love. And I mean that from all of those different areas, right? Like just us loving ourselves better, um, better, like, like more thoroughly, more, more knowledgeably. And then that includes me. Like that's the work that I'm trying to do. And, and it, and it comes in the form of setting boundaries, right? Frankly, drinking water and getting sleep. Okay. This is a message to me. Um, <laughs> these are ways that we show up for ourselves and help us to show up better for the people that, that are in our lives. And that's really, to me, the, the most important thing that I can do for myself and help do for others. And frankly, we try to do it through all of these different channels, keep it entertaining, Um, but that's really what I want people to know about me. I love it. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you. Thank you. Wasn't she amazing? I love Cody. She's such a sweetheart. At this point, I know tons of people who know her and they all have like the same Cody report. They're like, oh my God, she's so sweet. She's so nice. And I love hearing her kids like in the background. She's like, can you hear them? Can you hear them? Like, yes, we can hear them. It's fine. So that is this week's episode. As always, thank you for tuning in. If you need some ratchet and respectable in your life between now and next week, you might as well just wait for the podcast because really all I'm posting on my social media right now is vacation updates and thirst trap photos because I have decided to abandon clothing and shoes for the foreseeable future. I'm actually moving to a new resort today. It is further and deeper into the wilderness of this island. So I may abandon, you know, bikini tops too. I might just, you know, just be free. I don't think that's what they meant when they said let the sun shine in, but that's what I mean. I'm about to turn off this mic and go edit this from the beach. You and I will talk again soon. Thank you always for listening. It ain't everything, but that's what y'all getting for the day. Okay. Talk soon. Bye. We all have passions that push us to do big things in life. For me, it's recording this podcast. For others, they like selling their crafts online. 
all out of a deep burning love for logistics and order management, uh, no one's passionate about that part. But that's why they're ShipStation. They make it easy to manage your orders and get your products out the door so you can get back to doing what you really love, growing your business. ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers, including me. You can import orders from any sales channel, ship with any carrier using ShipStation's deeply discounted rates, and automate just about any shipping task. No wonder more than 100,000 online sellers choose ShipStation. I use ShipStation to sell all my merch for Ratchet and Respectable and don't waste your pretty. I love that it's so easy. No matter how you sell, Shopify, Etsy, your own website like me, ShipStation funnels all of your orders into one simple interface that you can manage from anywhere, even your cell phone. Ship more in less time for a lot less money. Just use my offer code RESPECT to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the little microphone at the top of the page, and type in RESPECT. That's ShipStation.com. Enter offer code RESPECT. Make ship happen.